Hello, everyone. My name is Miguel Myers. Welcome to My Horror Confessional, where every week I will have a guest come on and talk about one classic horror movie that they haven't seen and why. We'll discuss the movie, the actors, and probably get off topic quite a bit. Once I believe that they have properly atoned, I will absolve them of their horror movie sin. Today, we have Grace R. Reynolds. Grace is a native of the, of the great state of New Jersey, where she was first introduced to the eerie and strange thanks to local urban legends of a devil creeping through the Pine Barrens. Since then, her curiosity with things that go bump in the night bloomed into creative expression as a dark poet, horror, and thriller fiction writer. When Grace is not writing, she can be found dreaming up, dreaming up macabre scenarios inspired by the mundane realities of life. Her short story fiction and poetry has been published by various presses, including Bridget's Gate Publishing, Creature Publishing, Dark Matter Magazine, Death Knell Press, and more. She is the author of two poetry collections, Lady of the House, which came out in 2021, and The Lies We Weave from 2023, both released by Curious Corbett Publishing. Grace, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me here, Miguel. Yeah, I'm so excited to, ha uh, to have you on the show. Um, I was talking earlier, and for the Patreon, you can see I have my copy of Lady of the House. I have to kind of tilt it this way because it's not picking up. But yeah, um, okay. I'll hold my copy too. Okay. Oh, yeah. For some reason, <laughs> yours is coming up really easy and mine isn't. But um, it was uh, so I met you uh, at, at Ghoulish Book Festival earlier this year, mm -hmm. and we're kind of just talking about what you, what you had, and, and you told me the concept behind Lady of the House. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so intrigued by it and I was like wow that sounds so great so uh, I was wondering and I, and I know this is already, like you said it's already like two years old and you have new projects going on but this is uh I just had so much fun with this and I was wondering if we could talk about this one first and then we can of course talk about your most recent one um for Lady of the House can you from the listeners can you let them know what the concept behind this book was Sure. Um, so Lady in the House, it is a narrative poetry collection. And for those who may not be familiar with narrative poetry, it is poetry that tells a story throughout. So think of it as like a novella in verse, if you will. Um, so Lady of the House is about a 1940s riveter turned housewife after her husband comes home from World War II. Um, she is she is unsuited for her new role of domesticity, and she turns, she grows resentful and angry, and she festers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and don't want to give it away, but uh, it's really, really interesting. It's got um, poetry, but also recipes mm -hmm. in there as well. And if I was a better, more put together put together person i swear to you i wanted to take one of your recipes <laughs> and, and like make it and like have it like there's a sweet tea one right mm -hmm. and, um, and um i i drink like um unsweetened iced tea that's for the most part that's what i drink in water mm -hmm. um so i wanted to make that it's just like i'm i'm not that type of person to be that far advanced but i wanted to do that um but yeah so there's uh poetry in here as well as um recipes that she's making for her husband and some mm -hmm. of it include like uh, fantasies of her, um, including bits of him, pieces of him, and sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was just so much fun to read. Uh, and I, I read your intro to it, uh, and you were um, you were kind of going over the, the the feeling the feeling you should have when you're reading the the, mm -hmm. the book of poetry. So I was wondering if you could kind of um, tell tell us what what was going through your mind when you wanted to, you know, the process of may of thinking up with the book and then writing it. Sure, absolutely. So when I was writing Lady of the House, I, I don't know if I ever intended it to publish it. I sometime in the middle of 2020, um, I had really gotten into the idea of like, oh, does horror poetry exist? And I, I didn't know anything about the current scene. So I was just, you know, blindly navigating through the deep, dark and scary woods of horror <laughs> poetry to see what was out there. Um, but I, I was coming out of, uh, an unfortunately, a, a trying time of my life. Um, I had just recently left a job. We moved across the country twice, uh, from Maryland to Georgia and then Georgia to Texas, all during COVID, mm. mind you. So it was a very isolating experience. Um, on top of that, I think part of it was I was having trouble finding employment here in Texas because with COVID, they were canceling job announcements left and right. And for mm -hmm. what I did, remote work wasn't quite, um, it just wasn't an available uh, 
thing at the time. And then it ended up uh, being that my one of my child's needed specialty services for speech. So and she had to go a couple of times a week. Um, so it just kind of worked out. But I personally, I had to adjust to this new role of being a stay at home spouse. And, you know, you, you go to college for how many years and you're, you're told that you need to go be this productive member of society. And I think there was a part of me that had a lot of trouble adjusting to this new role. Um, and just the just the in, inner turmoil of trying to figure out, like, well, what is my purpose? Like, who am I supposed to be like in this in this role? Right. If you I don't know, it's just something that was on my mind and I've always had an affinity for anything vintage, especially um, I always like the, I think the fashion, of the 1950s and forties. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that like the times were the best, but it's like, I think that aesthetically it was, a, it's, it's very beautiful. Um, so part of me thought was like, Oh, well, you know, I could, I could do something with that here. And um, I think especially when you're going through a trying time of your life, you have all of this internal dialogue in your head that says really mean things like, like these intrusive thoughts that can get to you. And so I put some of those intrusive thoughts into this poetry collection. Um, and then come to find out uh, as I was writing it a couple months later that I knew I wasn't alone, that there, there was more than almost 2 million women from in 2020 left the traditional workforce to go back to the traditional home of being a stay-at-home spouse for childcare purposes, which was my primary reason for not going back to work. Yeah. So I, yeah, so part of me thought, I was like, well, you know what, I, I'm just gonna continue writing this. And then um, my friend Raven, she was uh, just starting a publishing house. I said, hey, if you wanna, you wanna experiment on my book, here you go. And that's, that's the whole reason what happened and how it became. <laughs> it's really a, like a gut punch, like you could feel like the seething hatred and rage that she has. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the name of the character is just the lady of the house. Mm -hmm. And then the, the man is the man of the house. Um, always in capital, right? Um, yeah. Both characters. Um, but the, the the hatred and the seething she has for her husband. And it doesn't start off like that, right? Mm -hmm. Like she um he's he's uh i won't go too too much into it but um this is very early on he is uh in uh, world war ii mm -hmm. and then she like you said she's kind of like a i don't know if this is um uh she's like a rosie the riveter type like yeah. Yeah, sort of thing and um she loves that like she loves being in the workforce and contributing mm -hmm. and her she was she was answering the call that her country put out for for her and people and women like her to come help out the war effort and then just to be like shoved aside when the GIs came home mm -hmm. and um she she wanted to uh um contribute outside of the household and her husband was like no and then just it just yeah. uh, this rage grew inside her and um, I just had so much fun with it. And when did you realize, or when did you have the idea of incorporating recipes in it as well? Well, I think so. The the, the poem that inspired to the the entirety of the collection, because some of them were individual pieces that were not put together before, um, was the the poem Ambrosia. It's my personal favorite in the okay. collection, and yes. and so I I looked at it. I was like, you know what? This would be really fun to put a recipe in it because I, in my head, I always thought, well, if I wanted this to be a book, I want it to look like my grandma's kitchen dining room table. Because I, I grew up, my grandmother had this plastic gingham tablecloth in her little kitchen in her 1950s rancher. <laughs> That's what I wanted. I, I wanted it to remind me of that and what we did in that kitchen. So I was like, there needs to be recipes in this. Or like, if you've ever seen the Better Homes and Garden, the, the red checkered book, Yes. I wanted it to be reminiscent of that as well. Yeah, which the the cover is just like, like you, the way you did it. Uh, so I don't know why it's not showing up on mine, oh, but it. Yeah, yeah, it looks yeah. so great. And with the little specks of blood, I mean, just was chef's fun. kiss it was great. It was fun. Raven and I made this cover together. We had a great time thinking of what, what made the most sense. And for me, I am a um, less is more kind of person. So I thought okay. if, we, if we just incorporate some of these key elements, I think people will get the idea of what's going on. Oh yeah, immediately, immediately. It's 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 simple, but it's mm -hmm. 
beautiful in its simplicity. So um, the, the other question I had for you was, um, it, is there a particular uh, recipe in here? I know you said ambrosia was, I'm forgetting, is ambrosia an actual recipe or is it just a, a poem? Um, and if it's not, do you have a favorite recipe? So it's it's both ambrosia. It's it's. I thought ambrosia was a dessert. They talk about yeah, ambrosia, ambrosia salad. salad. I've heard of uh, that. Yeah. yeah. So um, apart from that, I'm trying to think. I think that the chicken breasts, only because it's funny, because some of that is actually based off of a conversation I had with my husband. <laughs> really. It's why I put in the beginning of the book, like, my husband said he's fine. Like, don't worry about <laughs> he's, he's alive. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I have to say probably that one just because of the memory behind it. Because I, while I was writing it, I was just testing some things out. And he, I remember the thing that she thinks in that poem. I said it and he said, why would you say that? Why would you say <laughs> that? Yeah. Um, so I was actually thinking... Um, that the connection between your book, Lady of the House, and Creature from the Black Lagoon, mm -hmm. there is a, a kind of vibe there for, first because yeah. it was kind of made in the same era, but also the um, actress, Julia Adams, who mm -hmm. plays Kay Lawrence in the movie, is um, relegated to second status because they, they like, they don't let her like have her own agency or do anything. She's just like, on the boat but she's a research assistant she knows a lot of yes. stuff so there's like i could see like that frustrating part uh of of that character also kind of connecting to lady of the house mm -hmm. so i was wondering if if that was on purpose or was that a happy accident i think i've been happy in terms of the creature from the black lagoon i think that was a happy accident yeah okay and so i uh, I've had people ask me before like, why I've never given Lady a name, and that was intentional because I wanted I wanted people to see themselves in her shoes without giving her any just as little descriptors as possible. Like I wanted her to just be, I don't know, just like a hat that people could put on. Like, wow, like, this is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling like the lady because I feel like, like you said, like I feel like I'm regaled to second class status for whatever reason, yeah. um, and because I think that so many women felt like this post-World War II era because many women were shoved out of the traditional workforce um, to let GIs come back to their jobs or to assume new jobs. Um, and I think that it still happens today, probably to both men and women at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was intentional for me. I, I just wanted to be able to make it as easy as possible for someone else to step into her shoes. And with, in terms of Kay, I got super frustrated because here she is. They bring this woman out as a research assistant. She's clearly very smart and intelligent. She has all this great commentary and they're just kind of like, no, 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 Kay. Like, step back. Me, it's like, dangerous step, for you. Step back. It's dangerous. We have a woman on this boat. Step back. <laughs> like, well, why did you bring her? <laughs> yeah, that was definitely a frustrating part of it. Uh, but what you were saying about like kind of the every woman sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I think that's kind of really important to kind of like the success of the book because it, uh, you know, I, I had, I've had conversations with my wife about that where like, you know, we're thinking of having a child, adopting a child and, mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, you don't want the, the, the bulk of the uh, child um, care to go to the woman by default right. sort of thing. Right. And so I think that's a, um, a concern, a very real concern and very, yeah. very real thing that's happening in society. Mm -hmm. And it, it like, it can apply to any woman, which is, you know, sucks in society, but is great in, in, in the book, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my love fest with Lady of the House, uh, I'll end that for a second here. Uh, but I did also want to talk about your most recent um, book, uh, late, no, I'm sorry, uh, The Lies We Weave. Yeah, has that it. been, has that been published already? Yes, hopefully the cover shows up. It's a little dark. My publisher and I were talking about potentially reprinting it in a matte cover um, and lightening up the cover a little bit. But if you can't okay. see it, there is a there is an orb weaver spider crawling on it. And the the title of Lives We Eat is woven into the web itself, which is super cool. Um, but yeah, so the lives we eat, it's, it's a little bit different from Lady of the House, still very feminist in nature, um, but it primarily focuses on uh, one woman, one woman's journey, mine, of going, um, going from childhood to woman of womanhood and motherhood, and 
really exploring generational trauma, um, the things that mothers pass down to their daughters, um, and some of the horrors that are woven within, um, within that. And it's really a poetry collection that it, it has a lot of macabre flares to it, I, very graphic visuals, um, but it's very much, in, it's, it's, it's reclamation and proclamation to not pass down the same things to the next generation. Because I have two daughters myself. And so like, especially, especially as women, the lies we tell ourselves every day that society tells us who we are, what, what we should be, um, to be everything and more. Insert America Ferreira's monologue from Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, it's, it's pretty much, it's, it's planted ambitions, wounds that never heal, cycles of generational trauma that keep us from breaking free of our turmoil. So I, this is primarily written um, from a feminist perspective, but I, I also try to write it in a way where if you are not a woman, that there are things in here that you can connect to as well. Um, and I have beautiful artwork in here too. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, yeah. that's great. I worked with um, a friend of mine. Her name is Sue Ann Summers. I actually, she's one of my first writer friends I've met. Uh, so I, I joined the writing community online in 2020. No real intentions, just to share writing on on social media like Instagram and I made a lot of friends that way um, and so I try to connect with people still from that community I'm like oh Sue Ann does art I'd love to see if she would be interested in um, working with me on this project but yeah that's that's the lies we leave I call it my ten dollar book of trauma and <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's um yeah I it's it, it means a lot to me. I think if you have children, it might mean a lot to you. And I think if you, if you grew up with maybe some misunderstandings with a relative or a caretaker or a parent who um, did not have the best behaviors, it may provide some opportunity for introspective of like, why did they act that way? Who made them act that way? Where did that come from? And how can I reflect on my toxic behaviors and change something within myself so I don't hurt my children as well. Okay. That was a little long-winded. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I love it. I love to hear it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and what you were saying about uh, it being from a, I believe if I'm misquoting you, please correct mm -hmm. me, but saying that it was from a, a feminist point of view, but you mm -hmm. also wrote it hopefully for um, other people to be able to read it. Like, and then you, then in that, like just before that you quoted like Barbie and uh, I, I was thinking, uh, well, from the Barbie movie, America Fair, from the Barbie mm -hmm. movie, I was thinking how so many conservative men were having problems with with the Barbie movie and saying yes. like, oh, they're men, it's a men hating movie or something like that. And it's like, you just, it's not, it's not that at all. It's mm -hmm. a different point of view than yours. And it's okay to watch a movie or read a book that's for, that's from a different point of view, but they they don't understand it because everything's been tailored to them. To them. And, when, mm -hmm. and when they're presented with something that's not tailored to them, it's men hating. So I, I don't mean to get on a soapbox, but all that to say that um, even if you are a man or something, you should definitely be giving, you know, the lies we weave or even lady of the house a chance. Or even Barbie. Yeah, Barbie. My <laughs> wife and I saw Barbie this past Thursday and we loved it. Oh, it was so good. I love so, that movie. Um, yeah. And and myself, like I had a lot of barriers uh for Lady of the House, one being that I don't read poetry mm -hmm. very much. Um, and so I was like, I I, I don't do, I don't I don't know if I'm gonna enjoy it or whatever. Um, uh, but uh the way you described it and then I took a glance at it, I was like, okay, I think I'm gonna like this at all uh, a lot. And uh so gave it a chance and I ended up loving it. And uh same thing with uh the lies we weave. I'm, I want to give that a chance as well. Um so could you let uh Grace, could you let everybody know where they could follow you on social media, where they could support you, how they can throw money at you, all that sort of stuff? <laughs> sure. I think the easiest way is to go to my website. It's www.spillinggrace.com. So S P I L L I N G G R A C E dot com. And on social media, I'm on Instagram, X, Twitter, whatever it is tomorrow. <laughs> uh, let's see, Blue Sky and Threads as um, at Spilling Grace. I try to keep everything consistent That's here. Smart, yeah. And, and I am also on Substack under Spilling Grace. So. As long as you know Spilling Grace, you can find me on all my socials. So that's probably the easiest way. 
uh, you could go to curiouscorpidpublishing.com to purchase my books as well, um, or any other online uh, book retailer. So okay. it's, yeah, but I'm glad that you enjoyed the collection. I, I, I'm always trying to grow in terms of being a poet, but I also think I want my poetry to feel accessible to people who don't read poetry. So I'm glad that you enjoyed yeah. it. I did. My problem with poetry um, is that I don't know, you know, like, how to read because for me and my wife we read to each other a lot mm -hmm. and so for example that we were reading i was reading this book to her and then the the sentence ends in the it ends in the middle of us or in the middle of the sentence and it goes to the next line mm -hmm. so i never know how to continue so i just continue reading it as one line or obviously not because you cut it up for a reason right mm -hmm. right so it's always a uh, one of the things i find difficult with all poetry not just not just yours oh, and all yeah. that but um so but, but i was able to move past that because it, it was that good yeah i think with poetry too i think i you know i saw i think i was an interview i read um if you're not if stephanie Wytovich, if you haven't read any of her poetry it's phenomenal and you should she's, she is amazing amazing for a poet i just uh, recently read uh, an invest review copy of her latest collection on the topic of blackberries. Um, absolutely okay. phenomenal. But I saw in an interview that she uh, had said that for a long time, poetry felt inaccessible. Like it was this thing in school that like nobody could aspire to, nobody could connect with because we always read things like the Odyssey and Shakespeare and things that people, it, you know, that, that doesn't speak to people anymore. Um, I shouldn't say anymore. I should just say that in a language that we don't speak in, like the old English vernacular, if you will. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think with poetry, what I love about it is that um, it, it's it's filling so much emotion um, in a, a small amount of lines. And so when it comes to like line breaks, when you read it out loud, if you read something a couple of times, right, you practice it, you kind of get to sit with that poem and let it marinate with you a little bit and really feel like the what's simmering in between those lines that's that i really enjoy and not to get on my little poetry soapbox here but um <laughs> so like it's just in college i studied russian um as my minors uh and part of that was having to study russian poetry um and you get a sense of of language when you read poetry out loud like with russian poetry because you get to see rhyme schemes and you get to understand um the weight of a word i think that's really important so i'm glad you guys read to each other out loud that's really cool yeah um so it's funny that uh my wife actually took uh i don't think she minored in in russian but she had mm -hmm. a lot of russian classes in in college and there's one particular book that she that i've tried to read but she loves it. i think it's her favorite book mm -hmm. um uh, the master and margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. Yeah. Have oh, you read yeah. that? I have not read Bulgakov, no. Okay. Um, it's just funny because uh, she says that I cannot read, the only way I can read that book is by the uh, reading the unabridged footnoted version. And I need mm -hmm. to read all the footnotes and understand and understand the historical context. Mm -hmm. She she is obsessed with, with the Russians and yeah, all that like, stuff. So I just Bruce, thought it was funny for you to mention that. It's You should ask her next time um, if she's ever read uh, the nose by Gogol, like it's okay. called, or nos, like yeah, it's it's basically it's about like this aristocrat who loses his nose, and it's it's all this symbolism. I think if she likes, that, I think she would enjoy the nose. I know we've uh, I've read some uh, Nikolai Gogol, right? With, mm -hmm, with her, yeah. yeah, I've read some of that with her. <laughs> uh, I don't remember specifically that one, but I'll definitely ask her. I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, I would love to continue uh, talking <laughs> uh, poetry. No, no, no. <laughs> Uh, it, we're, I want to continue talking poetry with you uh, on the post show uh, Sunday school sessions. That's that's what we have the the post show for. So we can continue talking about that. Um, but uh, I did want to move on to the creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to first ask you what your history is with horror. Did you uh, horror movies, horror uh, uh, literature, that sort of stuff? Did you grow up liking it, or did you come to it later in life and that sort of thing? I think I. I grew up like doing horror. Um, you know, I didn't get to read. If you, I'm sorry if you hear a 10 month old screaming in the background. By the way, my apologies. <laughs> um, it's adding ambiance to the horror. <laughs> it's adding ambiance. Um, so I would say I've always been a horror fan. My dad really likes horror. My dad's a big Stephen King guy. So I, I grew up 
like having it in the house. I grew up coming home every day, seeing my dad watching poltergeist or Lake Placid on TV. It was one of those, it was one of those, one or the other. So it's always been there in the background. Um, and I didn't really come into a love for it until probably when I was in high school, uh, because what I would do, uh, my parents worked, you know, late. They wouldn't come home until dinner time when I would come home. Uh, first thing I would do, unpack my book bag. I would sit in front of the TV and I would find a new horror movie to watch when my parents got home. <laughs> nice. So I, I watched, I forget if it was like old on demand Netflix or whatever, but I used to watch like a lot of Japanese horror films, just anything I could get my hand on that looked scary to me, I was watching it. So that's probably where I first fell into love with horror. And I've always kind of stuck with it. Like with college, I probably fell out of it a little bit. Maybe it was my fault for watching the human centipede during finals my freshman year. <laughs> <laughs> that was my thought. You know, I don't blame watch- yourself for that movie. I, I watched it before one of my finals. It's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I can watch this. Going into that final, I was in a completely <laughs> different headspace. But yeah. after that, you know, I think I always try to stick up, stick with it. Like I do, I would say through film reading, not necessarily uh, just because of. I think, you know, you, you let your life kind of get in the way of things. You don't prioritize something like that. And I had fell out of reading for a long time. Um, and then I think probably when 2020 happened and everybody else remembered that books existed. <laughs> it's when I started getting back into it and I got into horror literature. Nice. Do you, do you remember, was there one book or novella or piece of media that kind of like, you're like, oh yeah, this is me. I'm coming back in that sort of thing. I'm going to go back to Stephanie Wychowicz. She, her, because you know what I did? I Googled horror poetry when that, because I, I said, this has got to be a thing. And I bought her collection, Morning Jewelry. And it's a collection inspired by Victorian morning jewelry. Uh, so if you don't know, like women uh, would, yeah, I was like, what women would, um, or I, it was very commonplace to take the hair of a deceased person and put it into like a locket or something like that. Um, as in like wear as a form of jewelry. Um, and I could okay. be messing that up, but like, that's what I'm, that's the kind of morning joy I'm familiar with, where like you could get a pussy put into a locket. Um, I, I know that there are other things that they did as well with, with hair, but that was a big thing um, post, post-mortem that they did back then. And I read that, I was like, wow, this is really powerful stuff. So I, I came in through the horror poetry track first. Um, and then I, uh, I, I started reading indie authors. Yeah, so I, I kind of got connected with uh, Marcus Hawk, who's probably one of the first people I encountered in the indie horror community. He's a Canadian author, and um, he, he, uh, he, he writes short fiction and he has novels. Um, trying to think who else I read. I really got into hmm, like Mona Cavani, if you're familiar with Mona. They are, I'm not an, familiar enough. They're, they're an author out of New York City. Um, they write, say, they write psychology for, but most of the people, I would say indie authors that hang out on Instagram is who I went, I, I kind of got exposed to first. And okay. then I think I got a little more traditional in my reading taste, in, or I should say trad pub in my reading taste. Um, but like, I've always, I say the past three years, I've been a, a repeat fan of like Laurel Hightower, Cynthia Palaio, um, trying to think who else uh just then no. like christina yeah. sung um and i just reading just reading new folks as well like i like max booth i remember really really enjoying his literature as well so i would say right now i'm more interested in indie horror just because i like that there's it feels like there's less parameters with it and that people can be more yeah. expressive um agreed yeah what are you what are you reading lately so for me i've uh been reading uh um Shirley Jackson. I've kind of gone back to her. Okay. Uh, I, I read Shirley Jackson maybe a decade ago. Uh, I read like The Lottery and I read um, uh, The Haunting of Hill House, mm-hmm. but I didn't read any any kind of other stuff, any other offshoots sort of stuff. And then uh, my wife and I, for our anniversary this year, we went to Salem and we went wow. to 
with, with Satan Con, which I, I just realized I'm rocking the Satan Con so uh, cool. stuff. Uh, but then, uh, you know, Salem is so close there. So we went to Salem and then like, mm-hmm. I didn't really do a lot of research going there. I just knew of Salem and the witch trials and that sort of stuff. When I got there, I was kind of fascinated with learning the history of it. So I came home and I did, I found that um, Shirley Jackson had written a kind of uh, straightforward history for children of of the witch trials. And That's I think it's cool. called uh, the Salem Witch Trials and uh, read that and absolutely loved it. And then so I was like, oh, I, I'm fiending for more Shirley Jackson. So then I, I just finished within the last week, I finished uh, We've Always Lived in the Castle, which is oh a very gosh. gothic, uh, like turn of the century uh, 19th century turn of the century uh, a book that was just a lot of fun mm-hmm. and uh, I didn't realize it but my, but my wife and I had seen the movie that was um, like a Netflix movie like two or three years ago mm-hmm. and I didn't connect the two and then I started reading the book I was like wait I've seen this I've read this I, I know this and then I come to find out I mean almost always the case is I like the book better right but mm-hmm. uh, but that that's uh, what I've been reading and I've also been reading some historical f- uh, fiction really boring stuff like uh, have you ever read any um um james clavel no i haven't i'm trying to like revisit i would say classics in horror like it's really jackson i haven't read since high school we read the lottery in english class so like yeah. i sometimes i feel i guess not as i, I guess I, I just don't know as much as other authors. like i I, I'm calling it homework from Bob Pastorella because at cool at Ghoulish he gave me all these recommendations like I've been reading books of blood, seem to dance macabre, and so I yeah like I'll, I'll add James Cavill on this too. Well, that's the good thing about <laughs> horror is like there's just so much of it. There's no way that you could you, there's no way you can see all the movies mm-hmm. and read all the books. And so for me, like as somebody who like gets anxiety from and FOMO from not watching a lot of things it's like it's beyond my control like I can't see and read everything so mm-hmm. I can just relax in that and just pick and choose what I want uh, and audiobooks have been so helpful because uh like I can I can be driving and listening to a book which is how I did um Shirley Jackson stuff recently that's what uh, I do for the most part if I if I'm confident that like like now my kid is like a sponge so now I don't do it as with certain books I don't do it as much but when she was younger if, if I was like, oh, you know, she's not going to remember this scene. That's fine. We will listen to this, this scary <laughs> book. It's fine. But it's, yeah. it's just very convenient, I think, especially because people's, as people's lives, you know, increasingly get busier for whatever reason, uh, whether it's having kids or go on your way to work. It's a great thing to be able to do in the car as well. Yeah. Uh, or, and- you know, if you're doing things around the house, you just want to sit and chill. <laughs> and it's important, like, to, uh, obviously, you want to support indie publishing and small Mm -hmm. uh, small books publishing and all that but also it's important to to support the library so like i get i get i buy my books it's very expensive having a friend who owns a publishing company and (laughs) and, and throws a book festival because i buy all the books at his his store now and then i buy all the books at the public at at the book festival Uh, Mm um so like i don't feel so bad now getting books in the library and just like getting them that way as well but Mm -hmm. um, okay how about um this particular movie, um, Creature from the Black Lagoon, how did this movie pass you by? I don't know, to be quite honest with you, because it it's it's very much up my alley. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I think I just had, I don't know how, I think I just kind of ignored some of uh, the classic horror movies. I saw years ago, and you might be more familiar than I am, it was, it was a like, 1930s or 40s classic horror movie set in a castle. Um, and like a murder happens and like all these paranormal thing, like things happen. Um, I, I think maybe just for a while, I just was, I think I just haven't been into creature features for a hot minute. And I now guess. I, yeah. and now I think I, but I think I'm gravitating towards them more again. Um, so like, I was thinking about like Frankenstein. So should I be reading Frankenstein this year? Cause I love, I love that book. Um, but I've never seen the movie. <laughs> so I, and it's, I, I, I told you about Creature of Black Lagoon because I recently went to um, a book signing for The Legend of Charlie Fish by Josh Roundtree. Okay. And so it's, uh, it's it, the, the blurb from Joe Lansdale is odd, creepy, funny, the Black Lagoon meets the six gun universe. You need this. Um, and so I was like, you know what? Like, 
I, it's a sign, a teacher from the Black Lagoon, let's do it. Um, but it, I've always just thought of uh, the creature, or now I know as Gil Man, as this iconic monster of horror. Um, it's a, yeah, I know I'm so glad that we're doing this because I, I loved this movie. <laughs> Awesome. That's that's great to hear. Um, and it, it actually it's actually it's pronounced Gilman. 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 No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's he's Johnny Gilman. It's Gilman Von Trapp. <laughs> so all right. So I, you're um, obviously we've said it a bunch of times now. You are on to confess your sin. Your mm-hmm. quote sin of never having watched Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, and I believe that's from 1954. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, I'm going to get into it a little bit, then we'll start talking about the movie. A real quick plot summary for people who haven't seen it. Um, geologist Dr. Carl M- Maya, I believe that's how it's pronounced, mm-hmm. is on an expedition in the uh, upper Amazon basin, and he discovers a fossil embedded in some rock. And we're going to talk about that in a mm-hmm. second. Yes, we are. Uh, the claw of an unknown creature, which demonstrates that whatever it was, was very powerful uh, with characteristics of of the creature being amphibious, he consults with the former student, uh, former student, who is an ichthyologist uh, by the name of Dr. David Reed, who is currently working for Marine Biology Institute in Brazil. Dr. Maya is able to convince not only David, but others from the Institute to join the expedition to unearth the remainder of the fossil. The team includes David's boss, Dr. Mark Williams, Mm -hmm. and Mark's research assistant, Kay Lawrence, who also happens to be David's girlfriend. Mark agrees to fund the expedition, mostly because of his ambition. It's said that he often takes the credit for any research of any significance at the Institute. That ambition often places him at odds with David. When they work at the site of the initial find to try and find the remainder of the fossil without success, David begins to believe from the geological evidence that it may be further upstream of the tributary at what is known as the Black Lagoon. What they eventually discover is that such a creature still exists in the lagoon. The animosity that exists between David and Mark uh, continues on in the expedition, and it may prove to be a lethal combination for some or all of the team as they decide what to do about the potentially deadly creature. And so that's the plot summary mm-hmm. of Creature from the Black Lagoon. It's not, it's a very short film. It's like an hour it 20, is. which mm-hmm. I love. Yeah, I was um, a big fan of that. I've been re-watching a bunch of movies. Uh, I, I have like a stack of Blu-rays that I bought and I've been slow, slowly whittling them down because I'm like, yeah, you bought them. You should watch them, right? Even though you've, I've watched them before, I got to watch them again. And it's, well, just a couple months ago, it was at 60. And now mm-hmm. it's at like, now it's at like, 10 or 15 but i've saved all the ones that were really long i Mm -hmm. kept so now it's just like two hour movies back to back to back and i'm like i'm killing myself (laughs) and so when i saw this movie was an hour 19 i was like hell yeah i love it so i just have some some notes that i wrote down as i was watching Mm -hmm. the movie and i think you did you did as well Mm -hmm. um so let's just go off that and um, did you did you want to go with your first note see what all right my first note is that this movie is a tragic monster romance (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's uh um guillermo del toro's um was it shape of was it the shape of water mm-hmm. like i i think it, i was reading up on it that he essentially wanted to do a remake of this movie but from the viewpoint of them actually getting together oh my gosh and, and universal was like no we're not <laughs> doing that <laughs> so then okay. he went on to make the shape of water and want to won a uh, mm-hmm. was an academy award for it so well you know it's funny so i i say that in a joking manner that it's monster romance but it kind of is because i know it's not intended to be that way but i would say the, the creature k is the only character that he doesn't intentionally kill right I mean, he doesn't right. kill k but he instead kidnaps her to his secret underground lair like it, it was fun to watch this movie with my husband and his commentary on the side because I, yeah. I would ask like oh what do you think they're doing what do you think they're doing so he's gonna he's gonna take her they're gonna have sweet gill babies together <laughs> yeah like what was the end point there like what you're gonna kidnap this and then do what like but that's just like all these older movies that's like what happened with king kong with, with when uh he he uh kidnaps Fay Ray and they climb the Empire State Building or whatever. Yeah, it's like I was I was reading that this was like an aquatic version of King Kong, essentially. Oh really? Mm-hmm. 
Thank, yeah, I uh, I had That's that. Nice. And I think part of me, I just kind of wanted to study up on some of the scientific things. Like it's like the Devonian period is apparently known as the age of fishes. So, oh, okay. They so, kept saying that over and over and over. So, so it was like, the, what is the Devonian period? I knew nothing about this. So I had to look that up and see what, what that was, like what ichthyology actually was. It's just the study of fish. I didn't know that. Now I do. Like, uh, let's see. Um, I got frustrated. I was like, well, I didn't mention, or I didn't Lucas mention the Gilman sooner because he clearly knew about this legend. And when they, when uh, Dr. Maya comes back to um, his archaeology or archaeology site, is that right? Or just his research camp? Archaeology, um, yeah, dig site, yeah. And he sees that is that Luis and Tomas have been have been murdered. The first thing they're like, oh yeah, it's a jaguar, not this <laughs> this man that lives in the lake potentially that I conveniently would forget to tell you about until we are in the middle of danger. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's that's right. You mentioned the character. I completely like. I'm so excited to, to talk about this movie. I completely skipped introducing the movie. So, uh, it was directed by Jack Arnold, mm -hmm. who went on to do uh, Revenge of the Creature, which was this movie spawned two sequels. And from what I've heard, the second one is better than this one. So I'm definitely okay. going to look into those. Uh, but he did Revenge of the Creature, This Island Earth, and The Incredible Shrinking Man. Mm -hmm. And then just randomly, he did the majority of the Brady Bunch tv series oh like that so it was really weird but funny uh and then also starting starring julia adams as kay lawrence mm -hmm. what have I, how, what have i seen her in because i i know her name i know her face i i don't know why i can't remember what else she's um, done so she became a really prolific tv actress so you might have mm -hmm. seen her in something but uh she was in code red which is a was which sorry which was a big tv show i believe in the 70s and then she was in a bunch of murder she wrote okay. so if you ever watch those um but as far as movies i um, i think sh she kind of transitioned from movies to tv shows mm -hmm. and just kind of dominated tv for the rest of her for the remaining of her career um and then we had richard carlson as dr david reed he was in it came from outer space as well mm -hmm. um Richard Denning as Mark Williams, Dr. Mark Williams, he was in An Affair to Remember. Mm -hmm. uh, Antonio Moreno as Dr. Carl Maia, uh, or Maya. He was in The Searchers. Nestor Paiva as Captain Lucas. He was in Let's Kill Uncle, which is a William Castle movie, which is so fucking good. It's so good. Um, and then two more people I wanted to talk about. Rico Browning. Mm -hmm. He's Gilman for the underwater sequences. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was in the sequels, Revenge of the Creature from 55 and The Creature Walks Among Us from 56. He died like six months ago. Oh he gosh. died earlier this year, February 27th of this year. He was the last, from what I'm, from what I saw, I may be incorrect, uh, but I believe he was the last remaining actor connected to this movie to pass away. Wow. Yeah. Talk about a long life. I mean, like, I'm, I'm sorry for his passing, but I mean. Yeah, all I the think, things he's seen. I think he was 90 years old, around 90 years old. Mm -hmm. So, and then Ben Chapman as Gilman, but on land. So they kind of broke it up into two two people uh, sharing the the role. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then also the screenplay was by Harry Essex, who wrote "It Came from Outer Space," Arthur Ross, who wrote "The Great Race," and Maurice Zim, who wrote "Jeopardy." So that's the. Did you see uh, you wrote "Jeopardy"? The movie Jeopardy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, we didn't yeah. know that. Like, yeah, he, yeah he, he was the one who would write all the, you know, uh, potent potables. That was him. He came up with that. Uh, all right. So my first note is that there's a really, uh, that I really love the intro score. Mm -hmm. It's like immediately old school vibes. Like it reminds me of RKO movie pictures, which is this uh, older studio company. I think they were the ones that did, um, the original, the thing, and then they did uh, King Kong, that sort of stuff. So it just kind of puts me in the mood for this kind of black and white horror movie that I'm going to watch. And this was only the second time I've seen this movie. The first time I saw it was with my wife about three years ago at the draft house. Um, they put on, they they showed it in original, and it's in its original format, which was 3D. So this movie was shot in 3D. That's uh, cool. They, I didn't know that. Over, yeah, it was just transferred over to regular. So we saw it at the draft house in 3D format uh, in a new, I think it was a 4K restoration. It looked amazing and I absolutely loved it. And um, not seeing it in 3D kind of brought it down a little bit for me, but still a great movie. Absolutely great movie. Um, but yeah, so that's the, I was already in, in the, 
like sensing the old school vibes with the music. And then really, I, I completely forgot about this. I was not expecting that like biblical, like Bible meets theory of evolution beginning, mm-hmm. like yeah. in the beginning sort of thing, the narration, it combines both creation and evolution. I was like, oh, you're trying to make sure that, I don't know, they were trying to make sure nobody was angry at them or something. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. That was something that I noticed too, um, just because I don't, I, I personally don't know what um, people thought back in the 1950s about how old the earth was. Um, and like how much religion had to play into that. Um, but I, I do, I do think that you're right. That it was trying to appease uh, some, another crowd just because of um, just the fire and brimstone, making sure yeah. that we're like, like, God did this. God made the gill man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then um, kind of like what you were talking about with the, what was the era that, that you said you looked up? The, the Devonian period. The Devonian period. Okay. They also talked about um, after they found the hand and they brought it to the, the, the research team, they were like, oh, is this perhaps a Pleistocene, I knew oh, I was going to mess it up, Pleistocene man. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what the heck is a Pleistocene man? So I looked that up as well. And from Wikipedia, it says it's referred to colloquial, colloquially as the Ice Age. Okay. Yeah, is that so, why they say like frozen? I, I heard like something frozen when they were at the site. Yeah. And so it's the ge- geograph, I'm sorry, geological epoch that lasted from 2.5 million um, to 11.7, I believe maybe million years ago, spanning the Earth's most recent period of repeated glacia- glaciations. The end of the Pleistocene uh, era, era corresponds with the end of the last glacial period and also with the end of the Paleolithic age used in archaeology. The name is a combination of ancient Greek, pleistos, meaning most, and kainos, meaning new. So most new. So that's what the Pleistocene okay. man was. Uh, so, um, and I thought, okay, let's talk about how they found this fossil. It's just the hand of uh, uh, the creature mm-hmm. just sticking out of the rock. Like <laughs> in, in the Amazon, these Brazilians and, and all the tribes and everybody's living there has been living there for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Mm-hmm. And nobody's ever come across this hand sticking out of the rock. I, well, and it was completely wild to me. I, you know, I was looking at that because at first when you look at it, it kind of just looks like a scraggly tree branch. It's yeah. like sticking out of the rock. But like, I, you know, also, you say from that perspective, it makes you think of like when you go to a college campus and like you rub this person's shoe on a statue for good luck, like hmm, oh, passing, yeah, yeah, yeah. passing through, shake the dead hand in the wall, kill me, I won't get you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny uh, or very embarrassing about that is so uh, you're I'm in Austin, I, f- I believe you're in a- or the area. Um, mm-hmm. I'm in San Antonio. San Antonio. Okay. Um, at a job a couple of years ago, somebody told me about some dinosaur footprints that were supposed to be in the area. Yes, and Government Canyon, I think it's called. Um, my, it's a... it, my, it, it possibly could be. Um, they were like, yeah, they were just like these footprints that were left in the mud and now people go to watch them or mm-hmm. check them out and all that. I was like, isn't anybody worried about like somebody breaking off the, the rock, the, like the mud and they're like, no, it's fossilized. It's hundreds of millions of years old. What are you talking about? I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. I was like, I was thinking people were going to damage these these things. So have you have you been to that site? I have. I okay. went. Uh, let's see. I went two years ago, twenty twenty one, with um, when my 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 oldest was a toddler at the time. We went hiking there one day. Um, it is it's pretty cool. Like it's a little underwhelming. Not gonna lie. Um, it's. Primarily in this space where you, there's a little bit of cliff face, and underneath that cliff face, you see a couple of tracks. Um, and then across from that, it looks like something that could have been like an old riverbed. And it has like these, these giant circles, is what they kind of look like uh, now. Um, they might have had, I guess, more defined talons at one point. I don't know what kind of dinosaur walked through there. Um, but there's a series of like giant circles. It is cool to see that, especially if you've never seen dinosaur tracks before. Yeah. Um, and then I say, if you're going to be in San Antonio, go see that and also go to the Whitney Museum because the Whitney Museum has all of those um, those dinosaur um, skeletons there too. Okay. I didn't, mm-hmm. So that, 
the the first one you're talking about with the dinosaur tracks mm -hmm. is that um like anybody can just go to that yeah it's a state it's one of the texas state parks uh okay. it's on the it's on the northwest side of the city i think i think you pay 12 dollars to stay the whole day um, and just hike around the area as much as you want there's some other cool things back there um like some of the like i think an old structure from one of the german settlers just randomly deciding yep yeah, this is where i'm going to put my house not not downtown where the metropolis is out here where I'll have to schlep a whole day to get downtown and come back for, yeah. you know, necessities. But I, if you haven't okay. been there, it's very cool. I think it's about a mile hike into the park. Okay. Yeah. I think I definitely want to check that out, but mm -hmm. I was just remembering that when we were seeing this fossil and then also homie just grabs it with his bare hands and he pulls did. it out. It was, it was just like, <laughs> just like no regard for like, uh, in, ensuring that it like it stays safe like everybody just handles it so like like if it's just something they just found on the ground like a, a rock or like a normal rock or something mm -hmm. you know so i something that i thought was interesting is that where's the rest of the body why is it just a hand and like you, and you know that there's no rest of the body because the whole team comes back and picks away at the rest of the ball and there's nothing there what yeah. do we think happened to uh to the body of that hand yeah, that and that's that's I think that's what he says. It's like, well, it could have been a, a tributary that leads to somewhere. So that's why they go to the mm -hmm. Black Lagoon to find it. And then that kind of that part of the plot, they just drop that when they find out that there's actually a legit like mm -hmm. creature there, you know. Uh, but I, one of the things I found funny also in this movie is the I don't know if this guy is like a. Um, a Quentin Tarantino type, but like he showed the creature's hand so much. I like love that. <laughs> My husband was so annoyed at that, but I thought it was the first time we saw the hair, I was like, oh, there it is. There's a monster. Just with the musical sting, dung. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And every time it kept happening, but there was some real cool time, uh, cool times that that happened. For example, there was a scene that like Spielberg kind of ripped off for, for Jaws, mm -hmm. you know, where she's, uh, where Kay is like kind of like the only scene that she gets to herself and it's of yes. course it's like her showing off her swimming. swimming the swimming suit i'm glad that she yeah. actually did swim because when, before she got in the water i was like what is she doing why is she wearing a bathing suit on top of the water what is she just gonna watch them in her bathing suit and like yeah come back to the <laughs> but did you notice that she was serving looks throughout the whole movie like she, she was i was she thinking brought, I was like, like a whole like a whole wardrobe i was just thinking about man i wonder what it kind of like what did she put in her hair to keep it from frizzing in the humidity? That was my first thing. I was like, wow, it was so great. <laughs> yeah, because they are in the Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, geez. Yeah. You know, I found out this actually this morning, I found out because I put on Twitter and I was watching this last night. And um, Kay Kaylee Scholes, so she, her, her book, uh, St. Grit, is actually it's coming out through Ghoulish. Um, yeah. She's she going to be on the show later on this month, I believe. So she, so she told me it was filmed in Florida. I was like, I was wondering where it was filmed because it reminded me of the place where you can go in Florida to swim with the manatees. And I got to do, I lived in Florida for a very brief period of my life. Um, and my dad uh, took me to go swimming with the manatees with a cousin of mine and uh, my aunt. And it, it I, I, I wonder if it's there because I think it's called Silver Spring State Park. And there is this cool, it's a lagoon that you can swim in. It has all these cool cliff faces that the, the manatees just hang out in. And it looks just like that. And so I'm glad that she validated that for me. Because I was like, where I was like, where would they have filmed this? I was like, because I don't know in the 1950s if they would have had the budget to film all of this in Brazil. I was right. like, it, I thought it was Louisiana at first, uh, but then I saw palm trees. I was like, well, I don't know if they're gonna have that in the swamps in the bayou. So the, yeah, it's 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 a it's a real place for most women manatees go to, yeah. go to florida <laughs> are manatees the ones that they think um the the story of mermaids came from i think so yeah, yeah. there's okay. there's so they're so cute too like they're and it's always heartbreaking when you see like a a cut on them from a boat it's it looks it looks like battle scars all over them. they're very sweet creatures uh, have you seen <laughs> Speaking of human centipede, have you seen <laughs> uh, have you seen Tusk? No, I haven't. Okay, have you heard of it? I've heard familiar of it. With it? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's all we'll say about that. <laughs> uh, all right. So, do you have any notes uh, that let's, you wanted to bring up? Let's see. Um, we, can go, we can go note for note here. I'm going to go back to the captain of the boat, Lucas. 
that fellow played by Nestor, is it Paiva or Paiva? Um, Sounds right to me. Uh, I, I, I just keep thinking about how he did everybody a disservice by not telling them about the Gill Man before they go downstream to mm. the Black Lagoon. Right. It's like, why why do you think that was like, do you think that was a fact conveniently left out? Like, do you think you just wanted to see what would happen? He's like, you know what? If you're getting my nerves, I'm going to drop them off the lagoon and go. <laughs> He's probably like bored, right? Because they, they, at one point they said they'd been there for eight days and they hadn't mm-hmm. found anything. So he's like, or maybe they hired him per, per day and they were about to like give up. And so he's like, okay, I'm not going to tell them not to go down there. He's got a, he's got a daily rate. He's got to keep that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's got to keep up with the maintenance of the Rita. <laughs> um, and then did you have you, this movie? Like, I, th- I think Anaconda ripped off Creature from the Black Lagoon. I never much. saw Anaconda because I thought it just looked so absurd. And I, I, I have, I, I have a fine line between movies that look totally absurd and like, wow, that looks funny. I'm gonna go watch that. Like, it's like there's yeah, some things like that looks dumb. I don't want to see that. So I'm funny on that. <laughs> so um, at the end of the episode, what I what I do is um, I I give you a recommendation of a mm-hmm. movie that's in like in the same vein as this, mm-hmm. and then I ask for a recommendation from you. Okay. Uh, and so I've already had two so far. Oh uh, no. Just t- talking from you of a recommendation I might have. Anaconda is one of them, but I'm going to save the other one uh, for surprise. And I'm not sure which one I'm going to go with so far, but I'm taking notes here. Uh, but but yeah, this movie, you haven't seen Anaconda, but it's basically the same premise. Just take out Creature of the Black Lagoon and mm-hmm. throw in an Anaconda and Jennifer Lopez. And then you got you got a, you got Anaconda. Um, but I, I enjoyed Anaconda. It was fun. Uh, mm-hmm. Also, I was a teenager when I first saw it and I was in love with Jennifer Lopez. So that probably had something <laughs> to do with it as well. Um, OK, uh, what, what's the uh, uh, next quote, uh, next note you had? Let's see. OK. So we see in various scenes how, um, I guess, Dr. Williams, he gets his harpoon out and is like, he shoots the gill man like a couple times. Why do you think the gill man is impervious to harpoons, but not bullets? Right. Like right. that's what, like the end of the movie, I was like, wait a minute. I was like, this is what, this is what takes, takes him out for real. Like <laughs> not the spears, the things that could go through. <laughs> And I, when I saw that spear gun, because like Kay and is it David? Yeah, Kay and David yeah. were just chilling, minding their own business, being all lovey dovey. Mm-hmm. And then Mark comes in, like just the holding that spear. Yeah, holding that <laughs> spear gun. And I'm like, oh, there's no way that the spear gun, spear gun comes back in the movie. Mm-hmm. Right. But obviously, of course, it does. Um, but I started to realize that um, the creature is like, michael myers like he he get he gets shot with the spear gun and just keeps on moving he's like yeah. any any kind of sort of slasher like rip, he gets, rips it out of his body and keeps and going just, it just keeps going like a jason type or something like that mm-hmm. um and then but he does get shot and we in this movie he he floats down and it is perceived i don't want to say that gilman's dead i don't know i can't make i my, guess he can't be dead if there's sequels right well it could be like son of gilman you, you never know it's the 50s right <laughs> but i couldn't fix my lips to say he was dead but mm-hmm. he floats down and we we believe that it might be the end for gilman mm-hmm. but um but before that happened i was like yo he's like a straight up slasher like a michael myers type or something he's just taking these uh, but yeah spears do nothing to him bullets will kill him but if he took six shots which is what michael myers took then i think i might have a new it, favorite movie it reminds me of like um you know this is the nerd thing me, in dragon lore how you how you have like their, high, their hides are so they're so tough they're impenetrable but if you find like the one the one scale under their belly that that can you, you find the weakness it's like uh the Hobbit, like smog or smog, 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 mm-hmm. like the the dragon from the Hobbit. Um, that's what it reminds me. I was like, I, I don't know if he gets shot from the front or whatever, but I was like, maybe he just has that soft underbelly that makes him vulnerable to such things. Yeah. Well, when he's standing, it's all underbelly. So. Did you see he also gets shot in the head? Yeah, that's pretty rough. He, he gets shot in the head. He's, yeah, he he, just, he went through it. I mean, realistically. 
he's not a monster he's just an animal like you wouldn't call like a lion or a tiger mm -hmm. a monster they're yeah. just animals that they don't know he's, what the heck they're doing you know yeah and he, he doesn't understand why these these things are in his lagoon he's protecting right. his face his fish friends they kill his friends like think about it. they kill his little fish friends because they yeah. dump all that white powder is it I forget what the powder is called that they they pour into the water. Rotenon. Rotenon. Rot is that a real yeah. thing? I just yeah, I looked it up. It is a real thing. Okay, rotenon. I'm right brain a little bit up to myself about that for future stories. My brain. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but like they they kill all his little friends because you don't see him eating fish. Like he's not. I mean, maybe he eats fish. I don't know what his diet looks like. But yeah. to kill if he does eat fish, they're killing his food source. So that's kind of rude. Um, yeah, I I. You know, I get a little sense of sympathy for the Gilman watching it because he was just minding his own business and everybody up in there comes in his space. And, you know, he there he perceives them as a threat and honestly, right, rightly so. Yeah. <laughs> so he's just trying to get rid of that threat. My only problem with the Gilman or with Gilman is the choice of his first, his initial victims, which were mm. all... Uh, the locals, the Brazilians that were yeah. helping him out. Mm -hmm. I was like, I get it, but when are we going to start killing some white men here? Please. They're I, the ones who, who are funding too. this expedition. I, I thought, well, you know what my husband said? He, when we were watching it, he's like, what? It's like, we're, he's like, we're just not going to bury them? Like, we're, we're not going like, we'll, <laughs> to, like, screw them, I guess. And like, we don't think anything about like uh, Luis, Tomas, um, is it Z that gets killed? Like one of the guy's brothers? The poor yeah. guy's like, my brother got taken overboard. And Mark's like, we need to go get him for science. No, like, doesn't care. And then that guy, so Z's brother dies, and then Z mm -hmm. dies as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that whole family is wiped out. But it's so it's horrible. Somewhere in the Amazon, there's a family who's like, their lore is that half of the family was wiped out by... The, the creature Gilman. for the Black Lagoon, yeah. Gilman. I, I think we should start calling him Gilman, by the way. Gilman. I think it's Gilman. <laughs> it's easier, right? Yeah. It's just easier. I was rooting for Mark to be killed, like, from the moment I saw him. I was oh, like, that dude needs to die. <laughs> I, as soon as I saw him, I was like, oh, he's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. He's going to be He's going to be a problem. And he actually was the problem. He, he but, was the problem. Um, I said, my note here was, uh, Mark's going to be a problem, isn't he? he <laughs> yeah, he actually was. Um. Do you think that Mark was jealous of David, like from a romantic perspective or from like a professional perspective? Because he was he was so gun ho about the scientific research because he wanted to get his name out there, get more funding for their research, all that a bag of chips. Yeah, I think the way I took it was he's uh Kay's boss, mm -hmm. and so he has like a particular um power over her like in a boss subordinate um mm -hmm. uh, dynamic and then to see and obviously she's very pretty and so I, i'm sure like he kind of had uh aspirations to be with her or something like that and then for this other person uh david to get to get her and he's just like another researcher he, he's yeah. not like the head of the program or something like that so i'm sure it's like a nice guy thing like oh he's not good enough for you sort of thing you know? i kind of wanted david to get killed too like he, <laughs> everybody he was, can get it yeah he was, he was getting on my nerves just like like you said like regaling k to the side like she, clearly she had a she knew what was going on he's oh i want to point out the first time that they could have left that mark was like we need to go he's like no we have to explore the cavern like mark's like we got we got gilman gilman herman gordon like whatever we want to call him <laughs> like we got him there. like let's just get out of here and i so i think we can blame david directly for entering thompson um did he kill anyone else at that point you forget or if he kills him before that oh, yeah the mark the mark gets killed after that as well yeah yeah, yeah. so it's, yeah and we can we can blame david for that because david just really wanted to get to that that little cavern to explore that so uh, yeah yeah david, i didn't i didn't understand that because like <laughs> Because Mark is his boss. He's like, no, we got to finish our research. <laughs> and he's like, all right, all right, that's fine. We'll stay. But like, I didn't understand it because Mark is supposed to be the villain. Mm -hmm. Mark makes a good decision to leave. Mm -hmm. 
which would save because at that point everybody's safe it seems like it should be the opposite where david should be like okay we have gil we have gilman let's yeah, leave yeah. now and mark should be like no we no, need we more to... research but it just didn't didn't i don't know maybe i'm just used to like uh because david's the problem he's yeah. the real problem <laughs> yeah like you just know that if Kay and david were to get married he wouldn't let her get a job yeah he wouldn't let her get a job but you did all that great research and you made me and mark famous that's awesome go home with our sweet gill babies (laughs) Um, and then she would be lady of the house that's (laughs) that's right together um I, my, one of my one of my um, notes here was, what would the lady of the house think of Kay? Um, I think the lady of the house would tell Kay to kill Mark and and David, or find find a way for them to conveniently fall overboard with some weights tied to their ankles, um, and leave and go. I guess head the Brazilian Institute of like of like what was it like marine research um yeah for herself and not come back <laughs> like yeah, stay there they, make the research and do her own live her boss life i i think they gave her like one scene in which she was able to sh- show her um mm-hmm. her smarts like what what she knew about it and then she and then the other scene where she was like swimming testing something or like yeah oh yeah 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 uh, um, but other than that, like she was just relegated to the background, which kind of really sucked because she, which w- happens a lot of the times with these sorts of movies is she's the more interesting character mm-hmm. and she's just relegated to to uh, the, the background, which kind of sucks. That's happened to me with a bunch of movies recently. Um, and like, my, I'm sure my list, <laughs> I won't go out and go in on it, but uh, have you seen uh, The Bride of Frankenstein? No, I, I told myself I would see Frankenstein first and then I would see Brian Frankenstein. Okay, yeah, yeah, that, that, that mm-hmm. makes sense, right? But the, I'll leave it at that then. Um, <laughs> one of the other notes I have here is the hand, we talked about it a little bit, the hand, uh, the creature's hand on the shore is getting ridiculous, but those <laughs> trumpet, the, the trumpets or the horns that they use it does a really good job for suspense. Uh, mm-hmm. It just keeps it kind of going. It's just like musical stings. You're like, oh, okay, we should be concerned here. And I know we talked about it a little bit, but um, going going back to it, there's a scene where Kay is doing, it was the swimming, like kind of synchronized swimming sort of thing. And she's doing flips and stuff like mm-hmm. that in the water. And then below her is the creature and he's swimming. That, this is really creepy actually for me. It is creepy. Like, yeah, he's it reminds like, me of why I'm scared of the, the, the water. So I, I don't go swimming, but there's, just something of something so dreadful about the idea that something could come eat you like it like like if you're in the ocean most of the time you can't see what's going on around you right, right. Like you, you're shuffling your feet through the sand making sure there's no stingrays that are going to sting your feet um little fish coming by maybe a shark i don't know but I, there's just something so dreadful about that especially because the whole time you see him like swimming on his back like looking at her and you're thinking, oh my God, is he, is he, is he going to come grab her and take her down into the weeds with him? Yeah. Which he ends up doing to Mark later on, which is mm-hmm. really kind of terrifying the way he kills him. He's just like, oh, this is my environment. I just have to bring you down long enough where you mm-hmm. run out of the air and then mm-hmm. you're dead. You know, I don't have to necessarily overpower you or anything like that, which he could have anyway. I don't know why they, but sure. why there's such a struggle yeah mm-hmm. uh but that was kind of creepy uh but the 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 part where he's um swimming under k they made a point of you know, earlier in the film saying that you know they can see a, f- a certain amount down into the water because it's so clear but she was you know when you swim you kind of look down you put your head in the, and she wasn't seeing him so i was, mm-hmm. was kind of curious what was going on there but the overall scene of him kind of mirroring her swimming was really just a great visual Mm -hmm. and then then her treading water with him like grabbing her leg 
obviously uh spielberg stole that for uh for, for jaws, jaws. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was so creepy and and i i know that she is a professional because something his hand grazed against her leg and she didn't immediately scooby-doo out of the water and back onto the boat mm-hmm. like she just like brushed it off and just kept on swimming i was like you're better than me because i the, no. Yeah, no, I would be looking it back to that boat. And she swam far away from the boat too. Yeah. Like, it's like, I, I would be sticking around. I would be waiting. I would just be waiting in the water like this is nice. Okay, we can go back up the ladder now, ready to go. I oh uh, I I always I I call it a monster romance because I that scene, I think it's a very romantic scene. <laughs> because he's looking at her with he's like, wow, look at this beautiful creature. She could be mine. Like it's <laughs> So do you think this is where Guillermo del Toro was like, hmm? I do. I I, I think that's the that was the moment he's like, I, there's something here. It's like the Phantom of the Opera, where the Phantom he looks from like he's he's always watching. Um, oh my gosh, my, I I'm drawing a blank on her name. Um, the, the I can't think of her name. Christine. He's watching Christine from I guess like the rafters of the theater. Like mm. he's all, always watching, always admiring. Like, you could do better than David. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and and then there were some really cool shots of underwater, underwater shots here. There was a separate director for the underwater scenes. Um, I'm blanking on the name right now. I'll, I'll look it up in a little bit. I thought that but, was really amazing. Like yeah, just, it, just the time it's, period. It's basically like a fictionalized horror movie and an underwater documentary, Mm -hmm. like mixed into one because the shots were just fantastic. It looked beautiful. Mm -hmm. It felt like another world. Uh, It just, uh, yeah, just I really enjoyed every time they were underneath the water, all the scenes of it. And um, there's at one point where David got his little like uh, player game on and like, went down and cut off it wasn't a it wasn't a flower but it was like a plant, the plant. i yeah. think that pissed gilman off i think that was gilman's plant because like, he he's, like yeah. he, he's like he took my plant no i i planted that there what are you doing that was, um, that was his house plant so, so that's when david got marked i i, I like that i, mm-hmm. I like to believe that but i think that's what really what mark what pissed mark off <laughs> was that like he uh had the forethought to like think of his significant oh the, no and that's the other thing david was a fuck boy right because in the what? beginning she uh the, um, the doctor was like oh when are you guys gonna get married and she was like oh david basically just wants to live together in sin and not and not get married or anything like that so he was a fuck boy yeah david should have died but so you said living together in sin i just made me think of one of my really really great friends she just moved in with her longtime boyfriend um they're very serious but somebody has been sending them Amazon packages. The first package one day was a box of 10,000 wafers for the Eucharist. <laughs> and the next day, the next day they got a chalice. And then the next day someone sent them why? And they don't know who it's from. What was the last one they sent? The, a chal, or I'm sorry, a, a bottle of like red wine. Oh, nice. Like, uh, that, sorry. Just, no, I love that. Like that I, but no name, so they don't know they, who it is. They call her boyfriend called was like, hey, totally, totally normal question. Did you send us this? I was like, no, but I wish I did. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I love no, when did, people okay. send random things like uh complete non sequitur to this, but a friend of mine mm-hmm. received a it was like a, a serving dish, like for dip or whatever, in mm-hmm. the shape of a dick. <laughs> and with seen. with no name whatsoever. Have you seen like the um, the charcuterie boards that are in the, in the shape of a dick too. Oh, I haven't seen. Oh my gosh, I'll, I'll find the Etsy link for you. They're they're they look very high quality. <laughs> so they got this with no name, and he was started. He texted me or called. No, he texted me. He's like, "Hey, did you send us a present?" I was like, "No." He's like, "Oh, you sure?" I'm like, "Yeah, I haven't." He's like, I was like, "What it was?" He's like, "Somebody just sent us a dick." <laughs> a dick. I was like, "Oh, okay, cool." So I, I, when you said that, it reminded me of, of that. So I, I love when people send random gifts to people and they, they don't say what it's for, who it is or whatever. Love that. Ooh. Love that. Um, all right. So, so David, David is the problem. So we're David is the problem. here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I've been saying a lot of my notes. Did you have anyone that you wanted to bring up? I'm trying to think of it. I've got the one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was like, what? I was trying to think of like, maybe some meta takeaways from this 
from this movie, like I, I, that man always causes problems. Um, do we think that the hand was the was Gilman's former partner? Because he oh. obviously wasn't, because he had both hands. So yeah, he, yeah, he, so it wasn't he, his. He, so he wasn't the only one. Also, my question, the one I put down here is, why are we assuming that Gilman, why is it Gil, why isn't it Gil woman or Gil person? That's We're right. assuming gender That's onto right. this creature. Yes, I agree. Gilman could be non-binary for all we know. Yeah, or it could be asexual or, you know, asexual. whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right. But the the hand, man, do you know how tragic that is? Imagine if like you were saying, that hand has always been jutting out of that rock mm -hmm. and the lo the locals left it alone because it was, you know, they deemed it as very important or, or mm -hmm. religious in some sort of way. And then Gil person would go, mm -hmm. it would, would always go to visit their partner. Yeah, how tragic then, is that? And then just, this American crew just takes it. Mm -hmm. Just he, like, that's where he goes because he obviously goes there. Because so you see the hand, like mm -hmm, he's getting ready to climb out, and he sees everybody else. Like, just kidding, I'm not gonna go. Like, and like, could you just imagine him, like, just wailing against the side of that rock, just holding his little webbed hand in that oh way? Oh my god, that's tragic. Just like, crying. Sharon, oh. I miss you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've cracked the code here. I think this is a truly tragic romantic movie. It is a tragic romance. It is. Yeah. <laughs> and he, you know, he just wants to be left alone in his grief just to get, just to get through it. Yeah. I, and I don't blame him for lashing out at the world when they've yeah. stolen his love, his, who he, his, who's been there for literally millions of years. Millions of years. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> millions <Absolutely> terrible. Of <laughs> oh, uh, the monster suit. I want to talk about the monster suit for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know like in the fifties, uh, one of like the running gags in like these sci-fi movies is like the terrible suit where you can see the zipper sometimes mm -hmm. and, or you could, it's just like foam and you can see like the human underneath. But this suit I think was really, really well-made. I wouldn't um, know how they did the underwater suit because like how, I don't know. Like, could you imagine just swimming in that? Like how heavy that would be on your body? And, and and the dude, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Risu Browning. Mm -hmm. He had the director wanted him to hold his breath for up to four minutes at a time. So can you imagine being in that suit, holding your breath for up to four minutes, and then doing performing all the stunts that you needed to do? I mean, it's it was a feat of like strength to do that. Yeah, he it, had it to be in great shape for that to do that kind of thing. I mean, he must have been if he lived, uh, you know, to, up to earlier this year, to the age of 90, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to mention that the designer of the creature, not the maker, so the maker of the suit was Jack Kevin, uh, or Kevan, K-E-V-A-N. Mm -hmm. He worked on The Wizard of Oz, and he made prosthetics for amputees during World War II. He created the bodysuit, and then Chris Muller Jr. sculpted the head but they were working off of the design of somebody. And for the longest yeah. time, um, it was said that Bud Westmore was the designer of the creature of the Black Lagoon. But very recently, within the last you know, 10, 20 years, it came to light that actually the real creator of the design of the creature from the Black Lagoon was Millicent Patrick. Yeah, it was a woman. Yeah, she was mm -hmm. a woman. She was a Disney animator. And uh, you know, Bud Westmore was the head of the makeup department and he took credit. He's basically Mark, you know, from this movie. Like he took credit for her design, which is so horrible, infuriating, horrible, infuriating. Mm -hmm. I don't, man. The patriarchy is something else. <laughs> it, it really is. Like it's Barbie, bad for everyone. It, it, Barbie's it, coming back. It's coming full circle. Gilman, it, Barbie. <laughs> um, yeah, when I read that, I just I was so angry about that. Uh, mm -hmm. What I mean, what. It sounds like you were aware of that as well. What did you think when you read that? I would, I, I think I wasn't surprised. I was like, that sounds about right. What well, woman does something super cool? Man says, "Well, I hired her. It's my project." <laughs> yeah, so. like I mean, she wouldn't be here if it weren't for me. So of course, it, I did it by the was it the transitive property? I, mm -hmm. I did that by transitive property. I did that. <laughs> 
uh, but 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 I think the design is great. Uh, it still like holds up to this day. Um, the only thing that was funny to me was the eyes. The eyes oh, yeah. don't blink. <laughs> just just, like... <laughs> and then when they finally <laughs> catch him and they they put him in that underwater cage at the bottom, he's just like staring straight ahead, <laughs> eyes not blinking. It's funny, but also Crazy. a bit unnerving. It is unnerving. So it worked out, I think. I personally like the scenes where he's like gasping because he's above water. He's like, like he just, you know, doing the doing the fish thing with, yeah. with his mouth. Um, I thought that was a really cool. I, I think that they just did a phenomenal job with the mask and it, it looked very realistic. Yeah, I get it. I, I guess they would have had to make two different suits, right? One for land and one for underwater. Yeah, they, they did, yeah. The underwater one, I mean, you can't see his eyes probably for obvious reasons because it's got to wear a mask and swim around. But um, no, I, I, it was just super creepy. And I, I, it would be cool to see like a color remasteration of this movie, just like the original, oh, the original yeah. colors to see like where the eyes supposed to be orange or yellow or like, because they almost look like glow in the dark in some scenes. I think that'd be really fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, especially like in all the artwork that we have for it, like the artwork that you have on, on your mm -hmm. screen, and, uh, they, they, it's colored. So I wonder if they did, they did that. I, I would definitely uh, check that out. That would be really cool to see. I, I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. I'm, I keep thinking of like the cinematography of it too, like how well it's done. And like you, you mentioned that there was a separate, um, a separate person who filmed underwater as well. Right. And I kept thinking about the aqua lung. I have to get the aqua lung to go see what's happening. So is that when they um when they go underwater? Is aqua lung the camera? Or what No, the... no, I think it's just scuba diving, like equipment. I think oh, that's, okay. that's what they call it, like the, the aqua lung. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know uh at one point they go down to the bottom and they're trying to take pictures of him. And they have this like rudimentary, like this old camera that yes. camera. Mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't think that they had that uh, I, technology back then. You know? It is surprising what they had back then. It's so, like I for Lady the House, I had to look up like when garbage disposals were created, like they were created, I think might be like 1952, like uh, just the things that they thought of back then. I, to me, it also seems like the 1950s just movies from that era, a lot of them are like very sci-fi based too because they, they're coming out of World War II they're entering the space age if you will um so I, I wonder if like some of these machines came about because of something like that yeah um that not to focus too much on it but that's that uh poem <laughs> with, with the uh was it called the um, oh, the garbage disposal? Garbage disposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quality stuff. That, that is a that is a real fear of mine. Like I, truly, I I I, I asked my husband like you don't you don't get worried about your hand getting stuck in there. And he's like, no. I was like, oh my god, what's it like to live without intrusive thoughts? That's amazing. So, do you ever drop something? Has ever something ever dropped like a spoon or something down there? And my my child has um, put coins in it. Oh, mm -hmm. so the, the, the coins would just live there now. <laughs> like, well, we would I just never use it. I didn't know it. I didn't know it was in there until I pressed the button to turn it on. I hear all this like this clanking. Yeah. So I had to turn it off and I, I found a couple, but there was, I mean, my husband had to take it apart to, to find the other one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a real fear of mine. I'm the person in the kitchen that gets scared of like, if you leave like a utensil sticking around with the dishwasher, you're going to fall on it and pay yourself. Like that's, that's my fear. It was just a movie, or maybe it was, uh, oh, uh, the Chucky TV series. Mm -hmm. There's a TV series for Chucky? Yeah, it's what? on sci-fi. It, st it started, like, in 2021. There's, like, three series, uh, three seasons already. But if I'm remembering correctly, I think the, the Chucky series season one did that to a character. Uh, and I have never had that fear. Have you seen it? <laughs> Until uh, that happened. And uh, I was like, oh, shit. Have you seen the new Evil Dead? Yes. I haven't yeah. seen it yet, but that scene with cheese grater, like that they put in the theater. So it's like, oh, that's a fear of mine. You're yeah. tapping into something. Kitchen yeah. utensils come to get you. Or um, do you ever get a, uh, now we're just talking about affairs, which I love. Have you ever gotten a, uh, um, what is that called? A, on your foot, like a, 
where they like scrape all the the dead skin off your foot and i have one of those yeah mm-hmm. like but w- a, 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 a a pumice there's a pumice stone, a pump stone yeah i'm gonna call well, it the, what's the, the cheese grater when oh, you go wow. to like a professional to get that done manicure pedicure, pedicure. pedicure mm-hmm. thank you yeah sorry it was gonna it was gonna it was literally killing me a pedicure um when they're doing that do you ever worry about that they're gonna go for too far and you're like yeah because sometimes it like, sometimes it hurts yeah like but then like at the same time you're like oh they're getting in there if it hurts it means that it's working <laughs> yeah and if you if you don't feel it you're like oh shit i should have gone a long time ago right <laughs> Mm-hmm. Now I want you to imagine Gilman in a pedicure chair, <laughs> just just getting his nail painted and getting yeah. a nice pedicure, still what, in the water. What uh, what color do you think uh, Gilman is getting? Oh, absolutely, like hot flaming pink. Yeah, hot pink for sure. Yeah, I think so mm-hmm. too. I love it, <laughs> but with one different, like with all pink. The, yeah, just one different. It was like a nice flower or something on the one nail. Like yeah. had to pay fifty dollars extra for one design. <laughs> but he's worth it, you know. But he's, he's worth it. He yeah. was, he loves himself. Uh, so uh, another uh, note that I had is I like the connection of the footprints in the sand from the beginning a shot mm-hmm. of like the evolution, uh, like the the first animal or the first fish to come out of the water, that part mm-hmm. of the, the first, I love the connection of that to, or the connection of that to uh, Gilman's footprints on the deck mm-hmm. uh, of the boat. And they're like, they're, they've realized that he's finally come on the boat. I like that connection from the beginning to the end of that. Yeah. I, I keep going back thinking about the, the evolution, like the theory, like the evolution theory. Do you think that that was a scandalous thing to put into a movie? during that time you know i i don't know because i think we've gone so far like and anti-science in this country that mm. I, I don't think so like because that was being taught in school and, then, and now it can't be it's illegal <clears throat> or in some states yeah i remember um even when i was in high school in new jersey uh i remember for biology class we had to get our parents to sign off on permission slips for us to attend the class, the classes that would specifically cover evolution theory, um, because, really? well, I think this was my principal was a, a Jehovah's Witness, and um, we had uh, no shame to Jehovah's Witnesses. I just this is my experience here, by the way. Um, but we had a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses in our class, and he actually pulled them out of the class and said that, "Oh, look, this mm-hmm. is not what we believe in our church. We can't do that." So I, I wonder if it was just him doing that and not like the actual school district, but it happens. I right. you, you know, well, you wonder. I, I went to a Catholic school for eight years from first to eighth grade, mm-hmm. and they conveniently skipped past all the evolution talk. That's what my we, husband said. He went to Catholic school too. Yeah, but we sure did have religion class every day. Mm-hmm. So, you know, learning the good stuff. <laughs> um, and then I said, uh, I noticed that they're in their hot boy summer hoochie daddy shorts they they go swimming like they are high up there i very re- mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a big dude and i very recently got shorts for walking that mm-hmm. come above my knee which i don't do very often and i was telling my wife oh i got my hoochie daddy shorts <laughs> she's like please shut up those are not <laughs> hoochie daddy shorts <laughs> and i was just watching them in their um this reminded me of like a, an 80s horror movie with when guys are playing football and they got the crop oh, top the, the denim shorts that are cut off like at their like mid thigh yeah and these were they were the coolest dudes in, in, the, in the whole school we need Rock real men back we need men <laughs> in hoochie daddy shorts to come it needs back. to come back it's time it's that's time. that's real masculinity yeah. um let me see i do you have a a, a notes Anything I, think, you want I, to I think i think that was kind of like i just that's the extent of my notes, I think okay, yeah. I, um, I, I'm disappointed that David wasn't killed. Like, um, I, I, you know, I'm also kind of disappointed that Dr. Maya didn't really have like more of a role. Like he was just like there in the beginning and yeah. then they kind of just pushed him to the wayside. Um, Dr. Thompson's character, I feel like, I don't know, cause he's just sitting there, like he's injured, can't do anything. Um, which is also a plot point in Anaconda. Is it really? <laughs> as well, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's 
there's some characters here that even even like uh the 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 boat driver the the captain mm -hmm. uh, i wanted to see more of him as well and there's one scene where like they're deciding whether or not to go home and there was that one part where mark wanted to go home and david didn't and then it was vice versa now david wants to go home and Yo. mark doesn't Thanks. and mark's like we're going home or we're not going home mm -hmm. right and the captain says yes we are and he puts the the, uh, the knife, knife to his, to his throat. throat love that love that scene like it was like he wasn't concerned before with when the gilman was on his boat in in his little waiting pool just sitting there all creepy eyed underneath like yeah. i yeah i i think i think they could have made the movie longer if they wanted to but i'm glad it wasn't it wasn't super long because it makes it easy to digest and enjoy it for what it is right and it was it was like all all killer no filler like it was suspense mm -hmm. right up until the end of the movie Oh yeah, no, they kept the action going. I really liked that it didn't feel like there was a like a dull moment because there there's always this looming threat somewhere, whether it's in the water or it's if you're in the jungle. Like the Amazon is full of killers, right? That's what Lucas says. So like they have all of these threats around them, and I guess it's like man in their arrogance thinks that they are you know immune uh, to to being attacked um, by creatures. So to speak, like especially like in Mark and David, you see their arrogance oh, in their research methods. Um, but no, I I thought it was I, I thought it was a really cool movie, and I'm, I'm glad I watched it for sure. Yeah, when you're speaking of arrogance, um, mm -hmm. the, my last kind of note here I had is that Mark went in like shoot first, ask questions later with mm -hmm. that spear gun, right? Yeah, and it, it was very much giving me like he 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 reached for a gun like Blue Lives Matter had asked sort of, sort of uh, uh, mm -hmm. energy from him. So I'm glad that Mark died. Yeah, no, uh, I but, but they, um, I think like there, there's some instances where it's like you fucked with nature and you found out that nature <laughs> fights back and that's what happened. You fucked around and found out. And um, so that's what happened with Mark. Uh, but th there was one scene that kind of, or one shot that really uh, surprised me um, it's when the creature f comes on the boat for like the fifth time because nobody's paying attention. <laughs> and uh, they're just like surprised. And I think it was Thompson who just like throws a lantern at him. Yeah. And the creature goes up in, in flames. I was like, oh shit, I was not expecting that. Like in a rubber suit, like how fucking dangerous is that for the person who was, I don't know who did the stunts, but like yeah. who did that? Um, I also wonder if they knew... Here's, I, I have some more beef too. Now, now that you bring up the fire here, if they knew that fire was the thing that deterred him, why wouldn't they just kind of have do more of that? If they oh, knew, yeah. like, because the harpoon really didn't work the first time. So why would they bring it back into the water to protect themselves another time? Yeah, and especially like, well, I guess I was gonna say he's underwater. Yeah, <laughs> but like well, at the end of the movie, where like mm -hmm. they're they're stuck in the bay they're stuck in the lagoon mm -hmm. in the name they're stuck in the lagoon uh i guess they can't use fire there but well like they have they know where the land entrance is to the cavern like yeah. If mark, if oh mark, yeah 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 if mark wants this dude so bad like you know like, like i to me put a bunch of fire like set up fire all over the cave right put a bunch of that rotenon in the water let it sink like smoke him out so to speak yeah they, they didn't think that through <laughs> um okay so uh that's all the notes i had for it there's just a couple pieces of trivia that i wanted to talk about here um first how the movie was thought up so producer william allen was attending a 1941 dinner party during the filming of citizen kane um he played reporter thompson when the Mexican cinematographer Gabriel Figueroa told him about the myth of a race of half fish, half human creatures in the Amazon River, Alan wrote the story notes titled The Sea Monster 10 years later. And he used it for inspiration. He used Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. uh, in December of 52, Maurice Zim expanded this into a treatment, which Harry Essex and then Arthur Ross rewrote, turning it into the screenplay for the movie. So, uh, that I think it's kind of funny that it's just like a random discussion at a dinner party, dinner party. turned into like a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal horror movie. 
you know, uh, pivotal movie in the genre. Maybe that's how the best horrors are created. I mean, I think about like Frankenstein, you know, they were, they were at um, like Lord Byron's castle. Like, and I think like it was raining outside. Like, yeah, you know what? We got time. Let's just talk about what scares us until you can write the scariest story. The modern Prometheus is born. <laughs> the modern Prometheus is Gilman. <laughs> <laughs> I like the Beauty and the Beast reference because that just strengthens my thought about this day of close romance. Yeah, right. <laughs> Okay, and then the last one I'll say is there was a research student um, or a researcher at the University of Cambridge by the name of Jenny Clack. She discovered a fossil amphibian found in the remnants of what was once a fetid swamp, and she named it Eucrita. Oh, man, I'm going to try to say this. Melanolimnites. Melanolimnites. And it literally means the creature from the Black Lagoon. So now there's a fossil, an amphibian fossil named after this movie, which I thought was great. I loved it. That's cool. I didn't know that. That's very cool. Yeah. So I, I guess what we'll do now is we, well, first of all, uh, I want to just get your general sense of the movie and then we're going to rate it afterwards. But overall, what did you think of the creature or creature from the Black Lagoon? I think, well, when I love the movie personally, I think that after almost 70 years that there's certain elements of it that still hold up today. Like that, the atmospheric dread that you feel throughout the entire movie, I think is, is a, a hallmark of maybe the classic creature features from that time. So I, I had the whole time I was thinking, I was like, wow, if I was in the 1950s watching this movie, this would scare the crap out of me. <laughs> it's because, you know, how many movies they have like that, like that when, especially with the, the realistic suit. Um, but overall, I liked it a lot. I thought it was a great movie. I, I'm interested in the sequels now, personally. I would like, you know, to see what maybe some things that they would rectify with the characters. Um, what did you think of it? Yeah, same. I, I really enjoyed it. I, you know, um, I think the first time I saw it, like I said, it was just in a in a setting that was just perfect um, with the, you know, the 4K restoration and the um, 3D version of it. And it was so, so great. Beautiful on, on the big screen. If you ever get a chance to watch it on the big screen, highly recommend. Um, so seeing it on the smaller screen uh, brought it down a little bit in, in my eyes, in my uh, in my esteem, but still, still really, really enjoyed it. I have a, had a blast with it. And I love, absolutely love the runtime. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love that it was like in and out. Um, like I said, not a lot of filler. So re- really enjoyed it. And like, they didn't have to go so hard on the uh, on the uh, design of the creature. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the story was simple. Uh, yeah, it's just a just a fun time all around. Um, so then what we do now is we rate the movie on a scale of five upside down crosses. Okay. So for you, and you could do half crosses, whatever the case may be. So, but and this is just today. Um, very recently I saw a movie that I had given five stars a couple years ago and I watched it again. It was like mm-hmm. four, four and a half stars. So it changes from day to day, mood to mood. So just how you're feeling now, what would you rate Creature from the Black Lagoon out of five upside down crosses? I would say I would give it four out of five upside down crosses because I do think that there were some things that they could have done better. Um, I especially considering that it might have been a transgressive movie for its time with like you know, evolution. Um, and like having a woman be a scientist in a movie, like, you know, um, but I do think that they could have done a little bit more with Kay's character in particular. Um, so I'm docking them, not sit down cross for that. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with the points you made. Uh, I'm, I'm at four upside down crosses as well. It's a great movie and it's actually one of my favorite universal horror movies. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not the biggest universal horror fan. I'm not big into like Gothic horror very mm-hmm. much um, with some exceptions, but so I tend to move uh, gravitate more towards like the Wolfman or creature from the black lagoon sort of thing. So this is my favorite universal horror movie besides Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, <laughs> but um yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so four upside down crosses. It's just, it's a blast. If you haven't seen it, it's a definite recommend. Um, I haven't met anybody who hasn't enjoyed this movie. There's something for everybody in it. You know, yeah. if if you don't like the movie, well, you got an underwater documentary. 
Hey, well, you know, I, I'm glad I, I didn't think about it until just now. It's like you said, like, like there does feel like there are some gothic elements to this film. Just like, you know, I think uh, like if we think about like traditional gothic, how it used to be set in places like Italy, um, things that were felt foreign to the readers of the time, which was England, right? It's it's set in it's set in uh, Brazil, and we have like instead of a house, it's a lagoon, and like all of these mysteries that are underneath the water. Um, and now it's not a, it's not a gothic, mind you, but there are some of those elements there. Yeah. I think. Well, like in a gothic horror movie, that you, there's always like the crypts underneath the house or, or the mm-hmm. catacombs or whatever. Yeah. And in the this cavern. movie, it's underneath the water and you have the cavern. So, yeah, I could mm-hmm. see that. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, what I would ask for, uh, I'm going to recommend to you a movie in in a similar vein. And then okay. I would re- uh, ask for a re- recommendation from you. All right, Grace. So the movie that I would recommend to you, it's actually two. Okay. Um, one I, we were talking about earlier, and I'm going to, uh, the reason why, why I'm recommending two is because you may not like this one, okay. as you said earlier, but it is Anaconda, Anaconda. from 1997. <laughs> uh, it's just, it, it's so similar to this movie. It's so striking how similar it is, but it's also its own unique movie as well. Uh, and it's fun, and, and and I enjoyed it. So Anaconda from 1997. And then the other one, this is more of a, it's a creature feature, uh, which you said you were looking forward to kind of getting back into as well. Uh, but this one is so bad, it's good. And it's Ticks from 1993. Ticks, like T-I-C-K? Like T-I-C-K-S, Yeah. <laughs> It's a group of troubled teenagers led by social workers on a California wilderness retreat, not knowing that the woods they're camping in have become infested by mutated blood sucking ticks. Oh my God. That's and amazing. it's got, <laughs> it's got Seth Green in it and it's got Alfonso Rivero, mm-hmm. who is Carlton and he's playing against type as he's trying to be like this badass gang member, this mm-hmm. gang banger. And it's so fucking hilarious to see. And it's so much fun. Um, so that that would be my two recommendations, Ticks and Anaconda. Oh, my goodness. I was like, I will definitely look that up. That sounds hilarious. Yeah. Right. So my my I have two I have two movie recs as well. One yeah. that is a, a creature feature. And then the other one, I'll, I'll, it ties into the second. I'll tell you why. Um, so it is the first is called Attack of the Crab Monsters. From 1957. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. All right. Synopsis is a team of scientists land on a tropical island to study the effects of radiation fallout. When the island begins to break off into the ocean, giant crustaceans begin calculated attacks on the humans, forcing them to fight for their lives. It, the, the, the poster, it's a little similar to Creature from the Black Lagoon, except it's like this giant crab monster holding a woman in a bathing suit like flailing for her life in his pincers. Love uh, it. Love it. Okay. And then the second movie I'm going to recommend because I'll never shut up about this movie is Microwave Massacre. I've heard of it, but I haven't oh, seen it. If you don't mind me looking up the, the year for it real quick. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me see Microwave. It's it's a it's definitely much a B rated movie, um, but it is based, it's from 1983. Um, so the synopsis is, a man kills his wife in a drunken rage and disposes of her body and cooking and eating it, which gives him a taste for human flesh. Um, it is one of the most ridiculous and hilarious movies I've ever seen in my life. And the reason why I bring it up is because the opening scene, he is eating a crab sandwich. And it's not just any crab. It's a full crab in between like two buns and, <laughs> and a piece of lettuce, this giant red crab. And he's a construction worker. And everybody makes fun of this of, uh, uh, let's see, let's see, his name is, uh, his name is Donald. And what makes fun of Donald? Because his wife, uh, his wife May is always packing him lunches and May is a terrible cook. Just, she just can't get right. Example, she makes a crab sandwich. And basically he comes home in a drunken super because she's made something. It, the whole point is he kills his wife over making like really crappy food, which is a terrible reason to kill your spouse in general. Um, but it's just so comically bad that you have to watch it. And he kills her, forgets he kills her, wakes up, is like, wow, I'm so hungry in the middle of the night. And, oh, he's like, wow, we have some leftovers in the fridge. Thanks, May. Goes to the microwave, 
puts it in like this is delicious what is it and then he sees oh my god it's like a foot and it kind of goes on from there it's it's very like it's coming off of like the like the 1970s movies where it's just like there's always like um I mean I shouldn't say you know, horror movies don't have sex and horror but like it when it was just like in your face sex and horror yeah 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 <laughs> um just it's it's so comedy that and on top of it uh the main character Donald the actor Jackie Vernon is the voice of Frosty the Snowman in the cartoon. Holy shit. <laughs> and and that's how we're going to end the show. <laughs> I want to continue talking about this movie and how you came across it. We will continue to do that in the Sunday School Sessions, which is the Patreon exclusive uh, show. If you'd like to support the show, patreon.com slash myhorrorconfessional. Um, so we will continue our conversation there. Uh, Grace, if you can let everybody know once again how they can support you, where they can find you, all that sort of stuff. Sure, yeah. You can go to my website, www.spillinggrace.com or follow me on social media at Spilling Grace. Um, I, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, X, whatever it will be tomorrow, <laughs> uh, Blue Sky and Threads. Um, and you can also check out my books at CuriousCorbettPublishing.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Grace, for being on the show. This was an absolute blast. I really appreciated it. Hope thank you had a great time. I did have a great time. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Everybody, thank you for listening, and we will talk to you next week. Yeah.